Time now to go to Lawrence Leppard. He is investment manager at Equity Management Associates. Lawrence, welcome back. Thank you, Max and Stacey. Uh, great to be with you. So let me uh, hit you up with a tweet from Egon von Greyerts of goldswitzerland.com said recently in a tweet, there can't be any clear sign that price discovery is impossible in this totally fake paper gold market. While fake paper gold is trading $70 trillion a year, annual mine production is a mere $213 billion. Your thoughts? He's got a great point. I mean, I've long contended that the, the gold market is not a real market. Um, you know, it's a centrally planned tool, and you can see that they bomb it at certain times. I mean, no no price discovery or no person who's interested in real price discovery sells the way they sell it at key points in time. Um, so I, I completely agree with you. And I think the interesting thing, which I'm sure you, you've observed and talked about a lot on your program, is that you know Bitcoin is something that's uh, you know pointing out their hyperinflation rather blatantly. And, um, you know, there's nothing they can do to control it. And uh, you know, I think they've got a real problem here. I think they've got a crack-up boom. And they know it. And I think they're scared. The crack-up boom. So this was, I believe, uh, postulated by Hyman Minsky. Uh, the problem of printing too much money is that eventually uh, people, like we saw in the 1920s, uh, they jack prices up to astronomical levels. Uh, and they use the collateral from those jacked up prices to finance more speculation. And it's a self-feeding phenomenon. It's an incredible bubble. I've been thinking that we are in kind of a 1920s bubble at this point. All the rules and regulations from the 1920s that were absent, uh, that were then imposed during the uh, cleanup phase in the 30s, those have all been removed. You know, you got rid of the uptick rule for short selling. You got rid of Glass-Steagall. You got rid of uh, pretty much everything that was imposed after the crash of 29 to stop a crash. It's all back. It's all being abused much, much worse. So are we looking at a 1929-esque crash at some point, Lawrence? It certainly feels that way to me, Max. I mean, uh, the, you know, we're going to need a PCORA commission to clean it all up. And you're right, uh, Siegel being eliminated is terrible. And also we've got derivatives. We've got much more linked markets and a lot more technology today. So, yeah, I think there is a crash coming. I mean, we've seen how overvalued the stock markets are. There's no real price discovery going on anywhere. And, you know, the cracker boom is so evident in so many ways. I mean, you see it in... Houses in Cleveland are selling at, you know, big premiums. I mean, people are, you know, they're smart. They know that 30-year money at 3% to buy a real asset on leverage, that's a smart move. And, um, yeah, it is it is very similar to the 20s, and I think it's going to end the same way. It's going to end badly. All right, let's talk about what's happening recently. A company called GameStop, it's a listed company. The uh, There's a big short position in the stock from hedge funds because they're in a dying industry. It's a retailer. Business is down. So the short interest was quite high. Uh, what the Robinhood traders have figured out is that you can put pressure on the hedge funds by engaging in what's called a short squeeze. If they buy the stock, then the short sellers have got to buy the stock also to close out their shorts. And the stock was up 100 percent, 150 percent. It was halted trading five times in a single day. Uh, there was speculation on the downside, speculation on the upside. Remember, Hertz was bankrupt and it was trading to new highs, right? So exactly. don't the regulators who are concerned about Bitcoin and opening their pie hole <laughs> and bleeding nonsense, shouldn't they be concerned about their own backyard? I mean, their, their markets are a joke. It's a farce because they, the regulators, are in bed with, with you know, they're the problem. What? They're completely captured. I mean, you know, look at look at Janet Yellen taking seven million dollars in speaking fees out of the industry that she's supposed to have been regulating. I mean, it's it's so broken, Max. I mean, in that particular case, it's shocking to me. I mean, how do you short more shares than there are shares available? I mean, I you know, in, in theory, I mean, from a legality point of view, I was under the understanding that you had to have a share to borrow in order to sell it short, and that company has a larger short position than shares outstanding. It's it's all a mystery to me, and it's a function of of the bubbly, crazy environment, you know, non-market environment that we live in. I mean, this is just, I was around in 2000. This is an order of magnitude worse than that. Right. I'll tell you how they short more stock than there is in existence. It's an abusive reg uh, show, I believe it's called, where at yeah. the end of the day, there's supposed to be a mark to market and an accounting of what shares are where. Look at the QSIP numbers, figure out who's got what. But the regulators don't do that. They push it out. They 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 say they're understaffed and they they can't comply with the law. Remember, Eric Holder under Obama said bankers are above the law, <laughs> right? So I, I, if you've yeah, got a class of people, okay. and yeah, the, the Obama folks are back in office now in Washington, right? So we're back to laissez-faire for 
uh, what I call financial terrorists. Some people just call them Lloyd Blankfein's <laughs> friends. And uh, there's going to be no law. And so this abuse by regulators will continue. And getting back to gold for a second. So the reason why Bitcoin is beating gold so badly is because there's no price discovery in gold, Lawrence. Exactly. It's a paper market. I mean, you know, I, I mean, there are, there are famous people, Jeff Curry from Goldman Sachs said, at one point in congressional testimony, there are 100 you know, paper contracts for every one gold ounce that exists. And I suspect that leverage is larger today. And so it, you know, it's not a real price. Yeah, I don't understand people like Peter Schiff. Okay, I understand he's a gold fan and he doesn't like Bitcoin, but he never mentions the fact that gold is a captured market that doesn't have true right. price discovery. He just bashes Bitcoin. So, so it just seems he's remarkably uh, intellectually you know, bereft of any real analysis here. The evidence is overwhelming, and these banks have pleaded guilty to manipulating the market multiple times. They've paid hundreds of millions of fines, if not billions, and nothing has been done. Nobody's gone to jail, nothing changes. For them, it's a cost of doing business, <laughs> right? I mean, they, they're doing fine. Yeah, it is the cost of doing business. Uh, and the, and uh, let's talk about the national debt is now $21 trillion, which is more than the GDP. Some economists are saying we need even more debt. Usually when the debt goes above GDP, that's generally a bad sign, Lawrence. Yeah, extremely so. I mean, if you look at history, all countries that have gotten into that position, you know, unless they're able to um, quickly balance their budget, uh, which, of course, if we're going in the exact opposite direction, um, it leads to severe currency debasement, if not hyperinflation. And, to me, the only question is just when does it come, how fast does it come, and how bad does it get? But inflation is clearly in our future. The alternative is a deflationary collapse, all of the 30s, and then a reset. And that's entirely possible, but I don't think they're going to do that. What, what I find most interesting, though, Max, what's going on right now is how threatened these people are. They know they're trapped. They know they're in a pickle. And so you see Lagarde coming out, you know, you see, and, and hammering Bitcoin, you know, saying it's used by terrorists. Then you see Yellen, you know, then you see... Uh, who's the guy at Harvard? Ros Rosoff, I think it was, or the, the professor at Harvard? Rogoff. Ken Rogoff. Rogoff, pardon me. Yeah. Um, you see all those guys coming out and, you know, they know they're in trouble. I mean, they know they've got a failing system. And, uh, you know, it's I got a real sense of shade and Freud here. I mean, uh, you know, it couldn't happen to a nicer bunch of people. You know, well, you know, we've been covering this for 10, 15 years, really, and calling out the names and uh, pointing fingers. And it's great to see them squirm. It's great to see a Rubini, a Christine Lagarde, the Bank of England governor right now, squirm. Squirm yep. in their little bags of poo because they know the game is up. And to see them go down is so satisfying because they've done nothing but undermine the economy and cause massive problems. So let's go on from here. China. Uh, right. The foreign direct investment into China has passed the U.S., Right. Uh, from last year. Will the U.S. resume this number one spot after the COVID, or are we seeing a permanent shift, Lawrence? You know, I'm not much of an expert on China, to be honest with you. I mean, I think that, um, you know, they've got a lot of problems as well. And, uh, you know, I think all fiat has trouble, including Chinese fiat, and there's a lot of leverage in China, and I don't think they have a suitable rule of law as we have. So I'm, well, I'm not a China bear, I'm not a China bull either, and I, I tend to just look at the whole, you know, fiat versus sound money argument. And I'm absolutely convinced that the sound money people are on the right side of the trade. And, uh, you know, that's, so that's what I focus on. Well, one admirable quality about China is when they find dirty bankers, they execute them. So this <laughs> is something in the U.S. I, I would like to see. You mentioned the Pecora Commission after the 1929 crash during the 1930s. Many, many bankers went to jail. During the SNL crisis uh, during the 1980s, many bankers went to jail. Then suddenly under Obama, it's like, we love terrorism. We love terrorism. Give them all money. Give them all credit. You know, and I'm like, wait a minute, Obama, you freaking idiot. You don't want that to happen, right? But he's like, no, it's great. You know, I had great hopes for Obama, but when he picked Larry Summers as Treasury Secretary, I knew we were screwed. And to your point about other countries treating bankers more harshly, I mean, I like this example of Iceland. You remember when Iceland had the banking problem and it collapsed? I mean, they were, you know, they were taking their Range Rovers and uh, Porsches and putting red paint on them, and they threw the guys in jail. I mean... Look, people know what's going on here. We are being massively screwed by the financial elite. And anybody who can't see it is just absolutely blind. And, you know, the only way for them to lose, and they will lose, is for their paper to become worthless. And that's in the process of happening, as you know and as I know. Now, Christine Lagarde over there at the ECB talked about Bitcoin as being the escape valve, right? So this is the <laughs> way out. Uh, if anybody wants to escape right. the central banking nightmare, and uh, this is the year that the U.S. dollar turns 50. Uh, no paper money has ever survived ever in history without losing 
percent of its purchasing right. power just going outright bust. Is this the year the U.S. dollar goes completely off the world stage, goes bust? You know, it's hard to say. I mean, certainly Alistair and Egon think that's the case. I think it could be the case. I'm not smart enough to know exactly how quickly it happens. Uh, I think I think there's a chance that it happens within a two-year window pretty quickly because, as, as you know and as I know, Gresham's law is going to kick in here at some point. They're in a lot of trouble right now. When gold goes through 21, 2200 with authority and Bitcoin goes through 50 or 60, which it's imminently going to do, you know, then then you're going to really see the bond market start to say, hey, what are we doing here? And they're going to look at the Fed, you know, with yield curve control and say, sold to you. Here's the whole bond market. And so the Fed balance sheet's going to go from what, 7 trillion to 27 trillion? I mean, if that's not hyperinflation, I've never seen it. So in my view, you know, it could happen very quickly. I can't guarantee that, though. And I, of course, you know, I thought it was going to happen in 2009. So what the hell do I know? I'm an idiot. <laughs> no, but these things do happen quickly. So, you know, remember Enron was worth 80 billion one day, worth zero the next day. Uh, you no, know, we right. have uh, many instances during the 2008 crisis that suddenly within a two days, there was a global credit freeze. Uh, banks were not lending yeah. to each other and short term rates oh, skyrocketed. And it all happened very, very quickly uh, because yeah. of the leverage. Right. You've got uh, hundreds and hundreds of percentage points of leverage uh, exactly. versus GDP. You know, uh, I wanted to ask you about the IMF called for a new Brent Woods. What, what is that all about? I don't know about that either. I mean, I saw that and I don't know what they really mean. All it, what it indicates to me is that they all know they've got a real problem. I mean, for those of us on the sound money side to think they're not game, you know, gaming this out is is naive. I mean, they're they are trying and to think of every possible solution because they're in deep doo doo. And obviously, a Brenton Woods and a restructuring, you know, they might figure that's a, a the least painful way to maintain their privileges. I mean, you can be sure these financial elite want to maintain their privileges. The, the blank fines, all these guys, they, you know, the, the way they lose is if the currency becomes worthless. We all lose, of course, but they really lose.